So in this video, we're going to talk about choice probabilities. At the end of the last video, I said these are going to be really important uh, characteristics uh, are, are a really important piece of, of discrete choice models and, and ultimately how we're going to estimate those structural parameters that we also talked about at the end of the last video. So let's start with kind of a thought experiment. Suppose that I told you, I set up a discrete choice problem for you, and I told you exactly what the representative utility of every single alternative was. So you knew that capital V, right, that capital V, the representative utility, the utility that comes from observed at attributes. Suppose I told you what that was for every single alternative for some decision maker. Would you be able to say with certainty what the decision maker would choose? The answer is no. Let's recap what we learned on the last video about the random utility model. We assume that the decision maker chooses the, the alternative that maximizes total utility. That was that capital U in the, last, in the last video, not representative utility. Representative utility is just one component of total utility. And we model that total utility as also containing this unobserved random component. That was what we called epsilon in that last video. And so what that means is that knowing representative utility is actually not sufficient to make some kind of definitive statement about which alternative is going to maximize utility. Because there's that unobserved component that the decision maker knows, but we, the econometricians, don't, that we treat as random. And so even if we could see representative utility and figure out which representative utility is highest, it could be that, there's, that it has a really low random draw and something else has a high random draw. And now what actually maximizes total utility is not the alternative that maximizes representative utility. So we're not gonna be able to model discrete choices with certainty. But what can we do? We can make probabilistic statements about what alternative a decision maker will choose. And these choice probabilities are going to make, uh, are going to play an important role in, in our discrete choice models. And just to kind of define them a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, choice probabilities here, that's going to be the probability of the decision maker choosing each of the alternatives. That is, if we didn't actually observe the choice, we could put a probabilistic statement and say, we think that the probability of choosing one is 50%, the probability of choosing two is 30% and so on. Okay, let's write down a formula for these choice probabilities. They're, they're ultimately gonna be these, these mathematical expressions and so we can write down a formula for them. All right, well, we said that decision maker N is gonna choose alternative I if the utility from alternative I is greater than the utility from all other alternatives. And so we can start by just saying, what's the probability of that thing? We're going to call that the choice probability, and we're going to denote it capital P sub NI. What is the choice probability for decision maker N and alternative I? Well, we decompose utility into these two components, representative utility and, and then that random unobserved utility. So let's go ahead and plug those in so we can take our, our capital U's here and replace them with capital V plus epsilon on each side. We're still saying exactly the same thing. We've just plugged in our, our, our version of, of, of total utility. What can we do next? Well, let's rearrange this a little bit. Let's actually put all of the epsilon, or both of the epsilons on the left-hand side and both of the, um, the, the Vs, the representative utility on the right-hand side. So now we're saying that we've got the probability that this difference in epsilons is less than the difference in representative utility. Let's pause here for a second. Let's suppose we just had two choices. We just had I and J. There were no other, there was nothing else. So we could kind of like get rid of this for all J not equal to I. That would just be implicitly only one choice. Then what is this probability? If we only had one, if we only had one, uh, sorry, one, one extra alternative, two total alternatives, if we were taking the probability that some, uh, that a difference in a random, in two random variables, well, the difference in two random variables is just a random variable itself. And suppose that we knew 
representative utilities, then what we've got here is the probability that some random variable is less than some number. If we suppose that we know what those representative utilities are. What is that? The probability that a random variable is less than some number? That's a cumulative distribution. It's just the cumulative distribution of that random variable that is the difference of these two other random variables. But we actually want to do that for all j, not just one, or all j not equal to i. So in order to figure out that probability, right, remember, we've, we've assumed that there's some underlying joint density of all of these epsilons, all the, I, all the different epsilon sub nj's out there. There's some underlying joint distribution for all of them. And so what we're going to have to do if we want to uh, kind of write down this probability for all j not equal to i is that we're going to have to figure out or, or we're going to have to write this down as um, essentially a multi-dimensional integral where we're taking this cumulative distribution for each combination of i and j and then integrating it over the entire joint density of all epsilon draws. So essentially we're saying here, you know, like what's the, uh, for, for some draw of, of epsilon nj and epsilon ni, we have an indicator for whether or not that is, uh, is actually uh, less than the representative utility. And then we need to integrate that thing over the entire possible uh, joint density of, of epsilons to represent the fact that, that some combination of epsilon draws might be more or less uh, common than others. Okay, so this is like pretty messy. Um, uh, I, I hope you have some idea of, of what this is trying to get across. If not, then I think this, hopefully this equation right here at least makes some sense to you. Um, ultimately though, uh, I, I think you can see that in, in this final equation is that, the choice probability is gonna depend on this joint density that we're taking the, the, this multidimensional integral over. And, and ultimately what we're gonna do is make some, some assumptions about that joint density. We're gonna make some different assumptions. Each of those different assumptions is gonna yield us a different discrete choice model. There's gonna be some assumptions that get us to a logit model, some assumptions that get us to a nested logit, some assumptions that get us to a mixed logit, for example. And so throughout the next few weeks of the class or, or the next couple months, really, we're going to be talking about those different assumptions about the joint density and how they get us to some different, uh, different kind of discrete choice random utility models. Let's look at a, at a real example of this, though. I think maybe seeing, seeing it with some, uh, with some actual variables might help here. So let's make this simple. We've got a person going to work. They can choose either to drive their car or take the bus. And we observe for each one of those, the time, so the time to drive or the time to take the bus and the cost. So like the gas cost of the car or the cost of, of taking the bus. Well, we need to specify our representative utility, right? We're gonna, we're gonna assume each one of those gives some level of utility. Each one of those utilities we can break apart into representative utility and random utility. And then we're gonna say that the, the representative utility is gonna be a function and in this case, a linear function of the data. So let's just look at the first one here. We're going to say that the representative utility that decision maker N gets from driving the car is going to be some uh, kind of driving intercept term plus beta one times the time it takes to drive the car plus beta two times the cost of driving the car. Once again, this thing kind of looks like a uh, kind of looks like, a, you know, a regression equation. And if we could actually observe utility, then we could just run this regression. But we don't observe utility. We don't observe representative utility. So we're going to have to uh, do something a little more complicated to actually get these parameters. But for just a second, uh, let's suppose that we actually know what those betas are. Right, let's suppose that we know the betas, we know the t's, we know the m's. We know everything here. So we can know what representative utility is. So we know whether the car or the bus has more representative utility. But remember, there's also like an extra unobserved random component here that gets us from representative utility 
to total utility. We don't observe that, we treat it as random. And so what that means is even though we know whether the car or the bus has more representative utility, we can't say for certain whether the car or the bus is going to have more total utility. But we can write down this choice probability. The choice probability that this decision maker N chooses to drive the car is going to be the probability that the difference in these epsilon terms is less than the difference in the, the, the representative utility, the Vs. And remember I said, let's suppose just for this slide that we know what, what betas are, so we know what those Vs are, then this is just a cumulative distribution of, of, the, of the random variable here. And if we want, we can go ahead and plug in our equations for, for representative utility. And, and ultimately what we're gonna get here is, is we're gonna see that um, uh, the choice probability is gonna be uh, the probability that, these, that this random variable, remember this is the difference between two random variables and that's gonna be a random variable itself, that it's gonna be less than this thing that's a, that's a function of some parameters and, and some data. It's going to be a nonlinear function of parameters and data, though, because the cumulative distribution of a variable is, 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 is of a random variable is rarely nonlinear. Oh, sorry, it's rarely linear. It's, it's always going to be nonlinear. And so our choice probabilities are going to be this nonlinear function of, of our parameters and, and our data. So what are we going to do with these choice probabilities? Well, ultimately, we talked about this a little bit uh, a couple of videos ago, I think. We want to estimate the structural parameters of the model that describe the decision makers, preferences, behaviors, whatever. On the last slide, let's pop back there, that would be these like betas, beta one, beta two, all those. And those are going to tell us something about how much utility decision makers get from driving, from taking the bus, uh, that's what the beta zeros are. The beta one is going to tell us like what's the marginal utility of the person's time. And then beta two is going to tell us what's the marginal utility of the person's uh, of money of the person, right? Because it, it's the, the parameter on uh, relating how cost, how, how cost and, and utility are related to one another. So ultimately, it's those parameters that we want to estimate. How do choice probabilities help us get to those? Well, what we want to do is we want to fit the model to the data. But what makes it for a good fit in one of these discrete choice models? Well, what we want is that when decision maker N chooses alternative I, we want the choice probability for alternative I to be close to one. And we want the choice probability for all other alternatives to be close to zero. So really what we're saying here is that when we say fitting the model, we mean we want to find the structural parameters that fit the choice probabilities to the observed choices. When we see you make a choice, we want that choice probability to be close to one. When we see you not making a certain choice, we want that choice probability to be close to zero. Once again, how exactly we do that is going to depend on what assumptions we make about that joint density of all of our, our, our error terms or our random unobserved utility components. And we're going to dig into that more starting next week. There are a couple of interesting properties we can see about the random utility model here, though. I've just written down that, that most general representation of a choice probability once again. And it, I think it reveals two important properties about random utility models, which we're going to talk about more later on, but I want to kind of lay a little breadcrumb here. I, I know I keep saying we're going to talk about all this more later on. I'm just trying to build kind of a, a, a foundational model here that we're going to work on for the rest of the semester. So, so, so we're not going to have any estimation in, in this week, but, but we're, we're laying the groundwork to get there. All right, so what can we see from this choice probability? Well, first of all, we can see only differences in utility matter. If we look up here on the left hand side, we've got a difference between two epsilons. And on the right hand side, we have a difference between two representative utilities. It's like any particular epsilon or particular V doesn't matter. All that matters is how they compare to one another, right? We ultimately don't care. Does, does driving give you 100 utils and, and the bus gives you 90 utils or does driving give you 40 and the bus gives you 30? What matters is the difference between the two. Just comparisons, not any kind of absolute values of utility. And so uh, one kind of important 
uh, fact because of that is that we can only estimate parameters that actually capture differences between alternatives. We'll, we'll, we'll see where this, this matters late, later on, I think. Uh, also, the scale of utility is arbitrary. Suppose I came in and I said, magically, all of a sudden, our decision maker gets twice as much utility from everything. Is that going to change everything? Well, no, the orderings are still going to be the same. If, you're the, if, if a certain alternative has the most utility, and then we double everything's utility, that same alternative is still going to be the one that maximizes utility. So, so, um, so everything we estimate is really only going to be estimated up to some scale parameter. And so ultimately what we're going to do, we'll, we'll talk about this more next week when we actually talk about the logit model, but ultimately we're going to kind of normalize variances of error terms to, uh, to normal, normalize our model to the fact that we can only estimate things up to a scale parameter. But, but we're going to talk about these a lot more when we actually get to, to estimation. And in the next video, we're going to um, talk about the linear probability model.